and I see your screen, so we're good to go. Great. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon and good morning, depending on where you are on this great Friday. I'm Sergio Aranda, Marketing Program Manager for eBuilders, developers of web-based construction program management software. We help owners like Facebook, Banner Health, University of Chicago, Chicago Transit, reduce project costs and risk through improved project information and business process management practices. I'm very excited to be kicking off eBuilders 2013 Knowledge Sharing Initiative with Mr. Glenn Laporte, Associate Director of Design and Construction, and Cal Meskrowski, Project Team Manager, Academics and Research at Oregon Health and Sciences University. Gentlemen, thank you so much for leading today's presentation. Thank you, Sergio, and I want to thank everybody for joining us. We, uh, we truly appreciate you letting us into your offices or wherever you happen to be uh, today. Uh, for us, it's this morning, so if I happen to let that slip, you'll, you'll understand what time zone I'm in. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how we use uh, in-house resources versus uh, out-of-the-house or, or outsourced resources. Um, so let's jump into a little bit of context. Uh, we're with Oregon Health and Science University. We're located up in the Pacific Northwest in Portland, Oregon. We were founded back in the late 1800s as a medical school that was part of the University of Oregon at the time. We've sp since split off from the University of Oregon and our own university, focusing on four mission areas. So of course, we continue to have academics centered around healthcare. We uh, have our own hospital, which is uh, it's over half of our, our enterprise at this point. We have a very large research component and, of course, spend a lot of time in the community. Uh, I put this up. Uh, we, we, have, uh, we like to joke that we have two very distinct uh, uh, areas of focus here in the organization, and, and some of you that have similar organizations uh, should get a kick out of this, too. Uh, we have the university side, which functions much like a government in that uh, we like to joke that everything is made by uh, socialization or decision by committee. And then we have the, the hospital, which is very much a corporate structure, very hierarchical, uh, very defined process, and of course all of the wonderful nuances that come with both sides of the house. So some quick fast facts, uh, we're primarily a graduate school, so our student body is actually fairly small for an organization of our size. Uh, we do spend a lot of time out in the community doing continuing education for doctors and nurses throughout the state. Uh, of course, we do a lot of research. We're top 20 with the NIH, uh, currently have over 3,000 active research projects. Roughly a quarter of a million patients, mostly from the Oregon area and southern Washington. Uh, of course, they, they like to visit us a lot. We just eclipsed 15,000 employees, most of them on our main campus here on what we call Markham Hill. However, we do have a couple of other campuses that we are expanding on. Uh, total rev, total uh, operating budget of roughly $2.3 billion. And we are a rather significant player in the business incubator space within the Portland area. We've spun off roughly 64 companies and counting since the late 70s. And we're happy to report that roughly 80 to 85% of those companies are still operating in the Portland area. Uh, a little bit more context around our built environment. We have three primary campuses. The main campus, which where we're, at, we're uh, standing right now, is Markham Hill, which houses uh, almost all of our health care, except for some outpatient clinic we have down on the South Waterfront. Uh, we have the South Waterfront space, which is a newer campus for us that we, as I mentioned, we're putting our outpatient down there, as well as expanding in our academic area. And then we have what we refer to as the West Campus, which is primarily research. All in all, it's a little over 6 million square feet, uh, once everything that we have under construction is completed in, in a little over 65 buildings. We have very unique environments, and they're very, very diverse, and they're always being repurposed and remodeled. So on our Markham campus, for example, we're extremely landlocked. We're are almost, prim almost completely surrounded by residential area. We can't expand, so we are in a constant remodeling phase. Uh, to give you an idea, the, the building that Kyle and I are sitting in right now was originally a tuberculosis hospital built in the 1930s. Our plan room is the original operating room for that hospital. And that is pretty much par for the course for what we work in day in and day out here within the campus that it encompasses buildings that range from brand new to almost 100 years old and everything in between. So a little bit about us. The design and construction department is a department underneath our central services. 
we are a full service internal owner's representative focusing on everything from programming through design and construction. We're a little bit unique in that within the design and construction department we have a safety and inspection group. Uh, we're also the primary, uh, primarily responsible for regulatory oversight. So working with our agencies having jurisdiction like the Joint Commission or the NIH. We manage a little over 350 projects uh, each year and the, the project value, the types of projects that we manage is of course very diverse. We have a small projects team that can do uh, anything from furniture to small office remodels, literally starting in the hundreds of dollars, to our capital projects team where our bread and butter is anywhere from a quarter million to five million dollars or more, uh, to helping to support the construction of new buildings like the Collaborative Life Science Building on our South Waterfront campus. Uh, just a quick look at our org structure and, and primarily the, the center should look very familiar to those that have a similar role. Um, what might be unique are the wings. So you can see on the far left side we have, again, that, that safety and construction component that uh, helps with uh, deliver our projects. And then on the far right side we have a small projects team that, again, handles all of those things uh, from day-to-day -day furniture needs to, you know, moving desks, moving people, office remodels, things of that nature. So we at Design and Construction, uh, we like to joke that we're the center of the universe. And if you think about project managers, uh, that's not a bad trait to have. Uh, from the project manager's perspective, you're responsible for everything. And you can put a really dark period at the end of that sentence. Uh, more importantly, we need to be coordinating with everybody. Of course, we have responsibility with the architect and the general contractor, but we also have a responsibility to our core stakeholders. And those can be both ex external and internal. And those internal stakeholders, as, as uh, many of you can imagine, can be very outspoken, uh, have very defined needs, and we need to find ways in which to help them reach those needs within the limitations that we work in. Now, some of that is just process, uh, but much of it is education. Uh, we, we tend to think of ourselves as uh, sometimes we're part of the academic arm in the amount of education that we provide around our industry. Kyle. So thank you, Glenn. Now you have an idea of who OHSU is, what we are. Now I'm going to talk about how do we handle those projects? How do we handle the delivery of those projects? Well, what we've done is we've taken three different unique approaches. We have one, which is our department, which is pure in-house. We have, as you saw, the department structure, a number of folks who are focused on delivering capital projects. The majority of these are refurbishments, rehabilitation, remodeling, a lot of repurposing. We do all of the in-house capital projects. And we'll get to that in a little bit, uh, the detail behind that. Then we to, uh, are approaching our large capital project, which is a new facility, a new building, actually a pair of new buildings, and a combination of internal owner's reps and external owner's reps. We have hired an external CM to supplement our own in-house team. And then finally, we have a location, two locations, where we are purely outsourced. Our capital construction delivery teams do not work in those facilities. We have various reasons as to why, and we'll get to that in the third part of the presentation. So first, the question is, how do we handle the in-house sustaining work? Across the millions of square feet that OHSU has, we've set up the ability to quickly expedite projects due to the demands of our hospital, academic, and research communities. The way we've done this is we have four general contractors, seven architects on three to four year rotating contracts. What we've done is we've negotiated with these firms to have fixed fees on all of our projects. And what varies is their subcontract work, their consultants, and so forth. But for the majority, we have master agreements with these folks where if we get a request to move on a project, we can scope it, design it, deliver it very quickly without being hindered by the procurement process contract process and negotiation process. We stay competitive by enforcing very, very strict bidding rules to their subs and their sub-consultants. So our general contractors are encouraged and often forced to bid out major bid packages to ensure that we remain competitive within our delivery project, or project delivery. This allows us to have very good relationships with our contracts. It takes a lot of the negotiating away from our project managers and it comes to cost of the overall project and actually allows them to focus in on the budget, focus on the schedule, focus on the scope. What it requires us to do is have very strong vendor management development skills. We've had general contractors who have worked on the Hill for a number of years. 
we call our main campus the hill, we have a number of contractors that are brand new. And so it requires us not only to help educate and learn, but also to re-educate and relearn folks who have been here for a number of years. That process allows us to develop very dynamic and high-performing teams. The relationships that our contractors and architects build, not only with our internal capital staff, but also with the OHSU community overall, which is just eclipsed 15,000 people, is very comforting. It also results in tribal knowledge. We all know that one person or a couple of people who could tell you the entire history of most of your campus or most of your facility. They know the ins and outs. They know the stories. They have the history. They can tell you the 18 different ways your room was configured over the years. What we are able to do by being purely internal is we can spread that knowledge over 30, 40, 50 people. So as people come and go, the knowledge does not. Finally, what it results in and it requires is the market watching competitive analysis. We are treated and have to treat ourselves almost as a business within or outside of OHSU. We're constantly under competition or facing competition from external CM firms, external management firms, folks who would like to outsource our entire department. So we are held to the same standard, if not a higher standard, as the outside entities or third-party entities who are offering similar service. Then the question comes up, does outsourcing really add value to companies? We've seen a global economic shift where for a while we were pushing everything to China, India, moving it around the world, going overseas. And now it's starting to creep back. We're moving manufacturing, some of it back into the States. We're moving IT tech support back into the United States. We're moving a variety of things back in the United States. Is there a right answer to the question? No, absolutely not. Let me show you why. To be internal, to be purely internal, to have a team, a department of 30, 40 people who deliver capital projects, it requires a variety of commitments and consistency. As I mentioned before, we have to commit to our vendor management development. We have to commit to teaching, to researching, to educating, constantly monitoring and measuring the performance of our relationships with our general contractors. With a three to four year relationship cycle, it's very easy for an underperforming contractor or architect to be ignored by our department. We can simply choose to not work with them. However, our other choice is to work with them, develop them, continue to improve them for the overall benefit. We invest in them. We invest from a business standpoint, management standpoint. We invest in that to see the dividends that we do get back over time. That also requires commitment to relationships. We have to commit to our own relationships within the department, relationships throughout OHSU, and relationships out in the community to our vendors, to our GCs, to our architects. It requires a different skill set than simply managing projects. We are constantly required and consistently asked to revisit our goals and expectations. We not only have to market them to OHSU, we have to market them to our own department and then continually repeat and set and repeat and set. Why are we in existence? What value do we provide? Consistent monitoring and measuring beyond scope, schedule, and budget. We are constantly asked to prove our value. That is one of the themes of being internal. You have to prove your value. It's one of the ways that we fend off and solidify our position against competition, which is the last point, the consistent competitive analysis of CM firms. Again, we do treat ourselves as though we are in our own business within the overall OHSU. One of the ways that we do this and one of the ways we build trust and one of the ways that we are able to demonstrate what we do is the transparency that um, e-builders allow us to provide. And I see Sergio, you have a question that you'd like to throw out? Yes, guys, if you don't mind, uh, I have somebody that asked as you were going through your slide as to how you work with different contractors in your uh, org structure. Uh, they. Uh, they, they're saying, I believe you're a public entity. So how are you able to negotiate with certain general contractors within uh, the question here? Sure. Uh, no, we get that question a lot. Um, we are uh, in, the, in we, we always start the answer with a smile, which obviously I can't do through the phone, so you'll have to imagine it. Uh, we are a quasi-public agency, and it's that term that makes us smile. Uh, so we were part of the state of Oregon until the mid-90s, and then the legislature created a special form of government entity called a quasi-government entity and granted OHSU that status. Now, what that gives us is, uh, of course, we, we still have uh, many of the regulations and protections provided to us by the state, 
but it also freed us in many different areas that uh, tend to make conducting oneself as a business problematic. And one of those areas that we were given much freedom was in procurement. So while we do have certain regulations, we need to go out and competitively bid, you know, we need to have uh, open, uh, open bids, things of that nature. Um, we can define how we go about doing that. And what we, how we defined that was that we went out to competitively bid and select four general contractors that we would put on a master list for four years. And then we'd repeat after four years. And that met the letter and intent of the, the regulations given our quasi-public status. Thank you. So with that said, it allows us to continually be dynamic and ever-changing. It allows us to expedite the overall construction process, and not just construction, the procurement, the planning, the development, the design, and finally construction and closeout allows us to expedite that. It eliminates those weeks or months of not only contract negotiation, but then also um, anything that has to do with the bidding cycle. So we're allowed to build multiple packages over the entire life of the project. I'll come back to that in just a moment. What I want to touch on is one of the things that eBuilder has been able to provide us in establishing this trust and establishing that answer to that question in addition to why we exist as a department. So people want to know, how do we know that we're getting the best price? How do we know that we're actually being competitive? If you're not competitively bidding every single job, every single project going through a design bid build process, how do we know that the price is the right price or the best price we can get? One of the things that eBuilder's been able to do for us is give, give us, from a management standpoint, the ability to slice and dice and pull information like you see on the screen and present it to OHSU leadership on a regular basis. They want to know how much hard cost, how much uh, indirect cost do you have. They want to know where your salary is, where does your department spread. We were able to show that 65, 70, 80 cents of every dollar is going to the physical asset of OHSU as opposed to indirect costs. This type of information goes extremely well on a consistent basis when we can show trend lines, when we can compile it, and we can analyze it and demonstrate the value that we're driving by having an internal capital program. This also requires us to have consistent education. We've had to clearly define our process, not too unique, still going through business planning, programming or planning, design, construction, closeout, but we've been able to articulate it in ways where quick education goes a long way. Everybody wants to move forward in the collaborative environment. And so what it's resulted in on top of our process map, our process flow of an overall project, is the inverted funnel, which you see on the lower left. It's the almost slightly anti-collaboration funnel. The reason being is that what we've done, and we've gained buy-in from all the stakeholders throughout OHSU, the leadership stakeholders, is that everyone does not need to be involved at every part of every project. It simply creates more confusion, more communication, more iterations, more confusion. Again, confusion, my favorite word. The inverted funnel allows us to bring the right people to the table during the right time of the project. And by having the process clearly defined and who gets involved when actually results in a lot of success. It allows us to become more efficient in the delivery of our projects. So a quick recap as to why we have our internal project delivery teams. Uh, the commitment to the OHSU mission is our department clearly understands the reason that OHSU exists is to advance teaching, healing, and discovery. We couple that from the management side with the business metrics to make sure that we are achieving that driving value that couldn't be achieved in another form or fashion. The unique advantage is project startup, again, by having those master GCs and master architects, we can expedite projects. And as we all know in the healthcare environment, it's an ever-changing world and you have to move fast. You can't have a 48-month project when you can get it done in 22 months. And the only difference between the two is processes, policies. I heard once and read recently that organizations will often spend up to 50% more because they don't trust in their people and they don't trust in their own policies and procedures. I found that to be a very true statement. And by standing behind that, we've been able to cut project time, overall project delivery time, tremendously. Tribal knowledge, mentioned that earlier, just having that tribal knowledge is invaluable. Pride of ownership, I've had the, the pleasure of attending the CMAA conference back in the fall in Chicago and listened to the gentleman who led the effort uh, in the New York City public schools. And his department, it was very, it was eerily similar to ours. They were about 10 times the size of us. And he went through a presentation showing about how they standardize project delivery 
and the results. And at the end of the conversation, somebody raised their hand and said, have you ever considered outsourcing your entire project management department to a CM firm? And his, re his answer after a few minutes of contemplation was, no, my department, my staff, my project managers love their kids and they love their schools. And I thought that was a very, very profound statement. I could say the same about our entire department. And finally, the City of Portland Facilities Permit Program, yet one more way that we found a way to expedite our projects here at OHSU. We have almost an open permit with the city. The permitting process is very, very short, very short. It allows us, again, to move quickly and deliver fast. I've got another quick question for you guys. Uh, based on the information you've been sharing right now, somebody commented, from what the team is presenting right now, it sounds like you've all been through lean training. <laughs> Uh, a couple of us have, that's true. That's a very good observation. <laughs> I think it's a combination. There's The answer is no, we all have not. As Glenn said, a couple of us have. It would be great to follow up the conversation with whoever mentioned that or made that comment after our presentation. Perfect. And then uh, somebody else mentioned uh, that their challenge is that scope of work that is not defined. I'm sorry, it says our challenge is scope of work that are not defined prior to starting the design and construction process. What process do you use to define projects? That, that never many? happens. Everybody always knows what they want. Um, <laughs> <laughs> go with the charter. Yeah. The, um, that's an excellent question. We run into that quite often. We've instituted, if I go back to the project process slide for a moment, the first phase of our project is the business planning. The second is the programming. The programming is the definition of the scope, and it has to be supplemented by the client or the requester's business plan. It has to show that it pencils out from an administration standpoint. Second is our department takes on the programming phase, and the way that we attach or attack scopes that are nebulous or very, very fluid is through a project charter. Using the project charter helps us to define really four key areas of the project. One is the business purpose. Why are we doing this project? The client and the requester have to be very clear as to why we are doing this. They have to be able to find that. Second is a very clearly defined and documented set of goals and objectives. What will be accomplished after this project is all said and done? The third area is the client, there's our client success metrics. The way I position it with our teams and our project managers ask is, if I ran into you, Mr. and Mrs. Client, a couple years from now, and you said, hey, we worked on that project together, that was a great project, and here's why, what would they say? So we document that. And finally, the fourth is the risks. We definitely document the risks, and we identify as many as possible. I'll give you an example. We had a, a project request to install a animal MRI, and it was an MRI machine that was used, purchased from another university, and stored in the basement of a building for about three years. And one of the risks we identified was, will it work? When we reassemble this MRI, will it actually work? And no one could answer. And so we definitely documented it as a risk. So it allowed us to put out of scope replacing the MRI. We assumed that we were going to have that MRI, it was going to work. And so by going through those four sections of the project charter during the programming phase, it allows us to get a better handle on and lock down as much scope, eliminate as much fluid or nebulous portions of the scope as possible before actually entering design. Yeah. By the way, there are a lot of questions starting to come in, so I'm going to ask one more before I allow you to continue because these are all very good and I get the feeling that you know people are, are truly engaged uh, in some of the inf with some of the information that you're sharing. So uh, the question was, oh, let me pick because I've, I've literally I've got about 15 questions in the queue. Somebody wanted to know: Do end users have any say or selection in the specific GC or architect that will be used in their project? And this, just to give you a little bit of background, is is coming from a large university on, on the West Coast. Yeah. So for the most part, uh, the quick answer to that is no. Um, we tend to not get our end users involved in the selection of a general contractor or an architect. Now, I say tend to. We have a couple of clients throughout or stakeholders throughout the organization that are in positions that they are constantly doing work. They're very savvy. 
they just they happen to be like a, an associate hospital administrator or a vice president in the university uh, that that just knows our industry. We might get them a little bit involved, uh, but it's very rare. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, Sergio, uh, you know, feel free to interrupt when you have other questions. I'll continue. Um, In-house and, and um, outsource team for special projects. So Kyle just outlined the value of having an in-house team. Uh, when we start looking at special projects, all of those values still pertain. Uh, we want to look. We want to leverage all of those things that make our in-house team really special. However, there are other considerations that we need to take on in the case of special projects. And special projects can mean lots of different things. Uh, for the context of what I'm about to talk about, uh, I would what we view special projects as would be uh, one-off constructions. So very, very specialized work, like let's say a nuclear accelerator. I'll use that analogy a couple of times or new buildings, as we're building the Collaborative Life Science Building in Skirties Tower down in our south waterfront. So that's the context of special projects. And what are those contributing factors? So in the case of, um, of some of our buildings, and, and especially our off-campus work, uh, ownership and funding become some contributing factors. So who is actually contributing to the, owning, to the ownership, and who's contributing to the, the funding of these projects? We get involved, as, as many of you I'm sure do, with projects that have multiple funding sources, whether it be from grants, it could be philanthropic. Uh, there's a variety of places where that funding can come from. Uh, the Collaborative Life Science Building, which I'll talk about in a bit, uh, for as an example, has nine different funding sources, three different owners. So that's, uh, from lots of different perspectives, that's pretty special. Uh, that requires a different kind of perspective on how you're going to manage that project than what we might do in-house if we were just doing a patient unit, for example. Now, we also want to look at resources and skill sets. When, when you consider our in-house team, they, the reason that they are so good at what they do is that they are they're very, very knowledgeable about our buildings. They understand our core missions. They know the stakeholders within those missions. And they know how to work within, I, I, I'll use the, it seems to be overused, but work within the system uh, within quotes. Uh, but that's a very valuable skill. When you start to get into one-offs, special construction, things of that nature, uh, there are skill sets that we don't have on staff. Now, some of those skill sets are worth pursuing. If, if you recognize that you're going to be doing something multiple times in a generation, it makes a lot of sense. But let's go back to the, um, the cyclotron or nuclear accelerator example. That's a once in a generation type of construction. I don't want to spend the time building that skill within one of our project managers and have them never use it again. That, that's not a good use of limited resources. So I'd rather go out to the market, find a PM who loves to wander the world building nuclear accelerators, and invite them in to help us with that. That's a great use of an external resource. And then, of course, Kyle mentioned the complexities. And it, in many ways, it's uh, the simplicities, but also complexities of the permit programs that we have here in the city of Portland. We, our campuses fall under the facilities permit program. However, some of these special constructions do not. And our staff are very used to, to running through that streamlined program. They don't tend to have to work with design review boards. They don't tend to have to work with departments of transportation and all of the complexities that those types of things throw at us. So again, an opportunity to bring in an external resource when developing the internal resource might not get us anything when you consider what we're going to be working on from year to year. So what does that look like? I'm going to bring another department into this conversation because typically on these special projects, uh, it is a col it's very collaborative amongst a number of different departments. Most notably for us is with campus planning and development. So in, in any typical project, uh, special project specifically, you'd have a huge planning component that would go on where we have campus planning deciding or working with the different constituents to figure out how does this fit within the business model, you know, which mission does this fit within. How are we going to fund it? Who are the, the different owners, if it's going to be multi-owners? Um, you know, what are we going to do about the real estate that we want to put this on? And then at some point through programming, that project would transition over to design and construction. And it's not to say that campus planning stops being involved. It's really who's driving it. So who's the PM? And then, of course, through construction, design and construction takes that over. 
Now, I'm going to get to the, the third-party consultant in a moment, but if you think about what these, these constituents do, campus planning, of course, is looking at the real estate. So what is it that's needed to actually build this special construction? Do we own it? Do we need to lease it? What are we doing? Which agencies are involved? Do we need some, something special from the city of Portland or the state of Oregon or, or whoever happens to be involved in that? Are there specific land use issues? Are there development agreements needed? You know, what is it that we really need before we can start breaking ground? And then design and construction becomes involved uh, really when you start digging into the programming. So we are very, very interested in delivering the program that meets our mission's needs, whether it's a researcher's need to conduct a specific type of research within the built environment, whether it is an inpatient unit, whether we're trying to get, uh, you know, figure out how to get a patient into one of our clinics, uh, which considering some of our geography is not always the easiest thing in the world. And of course we spend a lot of time coordinating all of our different owner constituents. We have stakeholders throughout the organization that uh, you would, at first glance, might not think are involved in a project, uh, but as all you owners out there know, uh, there's something that touches them, and we've got to figure out what that is. We have full agency having jurisdiction uh, uh, re responsibilities. So when we're talking about ensuring that the built environment will fit the need of the joint commission in the case of hospital accreditation, or the National Institute of Health, the NIH, in terms of some of our research grants. Uh, we want to make sure that, that the, the built environment fits those needs. Of course, we're watching the plans and the drawings and everything that goes into ensuring that we have that, that project documented, providing financial oversight, and, and all the things that go into completing the project, whether it be ff &E, wayfinding art, and so on. This is where we get an opportunity for a third party, however. So these special projects are, can be so big or so complex or so specialized that we start having needs that go beyond what we, we consider within our core group. So where we need to spend time focusing on programming, if we have a third party, we can hand off responsibilities so that we can really, really focus on our, our core benefit. And some of those opportunities are the, the boots on the ground, budget and tracking, uh, control of the budget, working with the GC to watch the cost of packages, you know, reporting back on, on what's happening with funding, ensuring that we're hitting the right buckets. In the case of the Collaborative Applied Science Building where we have nine funding sources, we have to report back to those nine, and all nine have different requirements. So we might have requirements from the state where they're only willing to spend money on the academic areas. We might have philanthropic funding where they're only interested in funding a clinic. Uh, lots of different regulations and requirements around those funding sources, and we need somebody to track that. And of course, all the meeting coordination, uh, contract negotiations and AE and GC coordination sort of go together. So we've written these contracts. They're very fancy. Some lawyer approved them. The state approved them in the case of the Collaborative Life Science Building. Who's actually monitoring that to make sure that the AE and the GC and all of their subs and subconsultants are following that contract? And some of them might have some rather unique requirements. So lots of opportunity for third-party consultants to help us in, in these very specialized areas. So again, the roles, uh, just as an overview, the owner, I can't emphasize enough um, how focused we are on the program. Uh, the scope and the schedule and the budget, you know, it's all important, but at the end of the day, that researcher is going to judge how our department did based upon whether he can actually conduct research in the way that he guaranteed the NIH he's going to do it. And that can get complicated. Uh, development regulatory, the Joint Commission and, and the NIH and others, uh, working with the State Fire Marshal and CMS to ensure we can get Medicare Medicaid funding, all of those things fall within our responsibility. Uh, our safety team and our inspection team are on the job. And then, of course, we're, we're interested in that long-term ownership. It's the pride of ownership that Kyle mentioned before that you just can't replace. You know, somebody that, is, that has 5, 10, 15 years here knows they're going to be here in the long term, takes a very different look on the spaces that we're building. But the consulting owner, owner's representative has uh, lots of very important responsibilities as well. They're a taskmaster, watching those costs and schedules in a, in a way that, that is needed in the, again, the boots on the ground, and bringing those unique skill sets. You know, again, I don't want to have to train somebody to, to build a nuclear accelerator. I want to hire it. It makes a lot more sense for our long-term resource management. So how does that pertain specifically to our collaborative life science building and Skirty's Tower? Well, a little bit of context around those buildings. This is actually, it's two buildings in one site. The Collaborative Life Science Building is a partnership between Oregon State, or Oregon State University, Portland State University, and OHSU. Uh, the, university, the Oregon University system is involved uh, as they have oversight over all the universities. Then the Scurries Tower 
is an OHSU, that's the taller tower you see on the left, the, the, it's really fifth floor and up, is uh, the School of Dentistry. We're, we're moving our entire School of Dentistry off the hill into a new building. We're combining their academic, their research, and their clinical enterprises together into one site and uh, putting it, of course, above the CLSB, the Collaborative West Science Building. So this gets complicated. We have uh, two buildings, multiple funding sources, multiple ownership. What does it look like? Well, we have two steering committees. As you can imagine, that gets rather complex. Uh, fortunately, it is five individuals that make up those two steering committees. One is shared. Then we have, of course, our consulting owners rep, which bridges both projects, and our architect and GC also bridge both projects. Uh, but as you can imagine, with, uh, with two buildings, multiple ownership, multiple funding sources, there's plenty of opportunity for unique skill sets. There's plenty of opportunity for work that needs to get done uh, where, where I couldn't simply add resources. It, it's not conducive for OHSU to bring in four to six people for the three-year duration of this project and then know that we're going to have to let them go. It makes much more sense to augment our workforce with a consulting owner's rep. So what does that result in? For OHSU, of course, we have leadership confidence in the team and process. They, they, you know, we meet uh, together with those steering committee meetings, and we are one group. It is the owner's representatives, uh, the true owner's representatives, the consulting owner's representatives, the A and the GC on one team. Uh, we manage resources really well. Our leadership understands that I can't simply staff up and staff down in the, in the, the numbers that we're talking about to staff these special projects, and they understand I can't build unique skill sets that I'll never need again. That just doesn't make sense. Uh, there are very unique advantages, of course, to having that combined team. You still get program focused. We're very, very program focused. Uh, you get all the tribal knowledge and the pride of ownership, but it gives us a lot of flexibility. So as many of you have experienced, as uh, the consultants on the call can, can resonate with, uh, it gives us the ability to find those skill sets that we need, whether it is some of the more mundane tasks of scheduling, and cost control, those kinds of things, or again, the, the very skilled, the very specific skills that we might need for, uh, for special projects. All right, Sergio, we're about to switch. Did you have other questions you wanted to throw at us? I do. So perfect timing. So we have um, <clears throat> we have someone wanting to know is asset management function and construction department. Can you say that again? <clears throat> is asset management is the asset management function at, of the design and construction department? Okay. In other words, do you guys, I guess, you know, actually execute asset management as part of your uh, responsibilities? So the short answer is no. If the question is in the context of the operations and facilities assets, if we're talking air handlers and components, fire sprinkler, fire dampers, that sort of thing, the answer there is no. We still go through a commissioning process when we go through a knowledge transfer during our closeout process to move that information to our operations and maintenance folks who are much more capable and better equipped to manage the assets. Okay. Then the other question that I got, I actually got a question by email from somebody wanting to know, uh, how do you handle FF&E procurement? So we, we break up, uh, well, let's, we can talk about all three components. Furniture is uh, typically done all in-house. So that's one of the benefits of having our small project team. They have relationships with the vendors. They're doing this day in and day out on the, the main campus anyway. So what I, what I typically do is makes the uh, small projects team manager really happy. I typically steal one of his staff for the big projects. And then uh, Kyle and uh, his peer on the hospital will uh, do the same. They'll leverage those resources to do furniture. Now, fixtures and equipment, uh, it depends on the project, but what we typically look at is um, we categorize the, the fixtures and equipment into three categories, so type one, type two, type three. Type one would be uh, written into the documents and purchased by the GC, so that's what we're talking about, big assets, like, like Kyle was just mentioning. Uh, type two would be equipment that is going to be purchased from the project funds but the procurement is actually going to happen through the university or the hospital, in which case our procurement department gets involved and they'll typically assign a buyer to help us with that equipment. So we'll have, we might have one of our staff on the program level working with uh, the, the stakeholders, the end users, to identify what that equipment is 
and then we'll have a buyer out of, out of our supply chain area help us with the actual procurement. They'll pool all of the, the orders and make those. And then there's the Type 3 equipment, which is strictly the department's responsibility. So this is where you start getting into you know, residential appliances or copiers and things of that nature. And uh, that's truly an, a department responsibility. They'll still work with supply chain, but it's outside of the project. Okay, I'm going to ask you one more question, and I think this might get answered in the <clears throat> in terms of what you're going to be covering over the next set of slides. But uh, somebody wanted to know more about your process of identifying and selecting an external CM. Now that uh, that's actually done through a, a formal competitive bid structure. Uh, we don't keep those on a master list. Uh, so what we will do when we identify a project is we'll go out to the market with an RFP and we'll go through a selection process. Usually involves, of course, proposals, interviews, re um, reference checks, things of that nature, but very traditional. So that's a great question to segue into the last part of the presentation. So stay with me. We only have a few minutes left yep. in the slides left before we wrap up the actual formal portion of the presentation. So we do have a few locations where we have outsourced wholly the operations of the building and the capital project portion, the capital reinvestment portion of the facility. So there's a couple of contributing factors and where we've taken this into consideration is how, why would we make the decision to do that if we're running so many projects internally and we have an entire department internally? Well, one is pure location. Of the two locations, the two facilities where we have an external CM, an external um, building management company involved, one of them is not too far, but they're still in Portland. And the other one is a little bit farther away, all the way across the country in Florida. Uh, so location is definitely one consideration. Funding and ownership, how is the building funded? Who owns it? How is it owned? What's the relationship with OHSU? Do we own it outright? Do we lease it? Do we, are we partnered with someone? The complexity of the ownership and funding certainly comes into play. The building components and systems, as we all know, the, the sooner our operating engineers and building managers can get involved in the construction of a building, the more likely we are to be successful in the operation of that building and over its life. If our capital construction group and our internal facilities management group was involved early and often during the project, as they are in the current CLSB Skirties Tower that Glenn spoke of, then it, we have a higher chance of success. It makes a lot more sense for us to be involved and us to be involved in further future capital projects. In the situation where we have it purely outsourced, those firms were brought in during the construction. Again, proximity was number one, but other factors contributed. And then finally, the program. We go back to the missions of OHSU. Are the programs of these facilities completely online, auxiliary? Are they augmented by or augmenting our missions of OHSU? Does it really relate to the core components and the core competencies of our department? So all of these factors come into play as to when we decide whether or not to bring on the CM and then ultimately outsource the entire building management, building operations. So the one I mentioned that was across the country is our Vaccine and Gene Therapy Institute located in Port St. Lucie, Florida. It's actually about 100 miles north of where Sergio is sitting right now in Fort Lauderdale. This building was constructed, constructed through a variety of sequence of events, um, not very linear. There was a variety of things that led to the construction of this, but we ultimately uh, generated a very nice building. Uh, one, of the, one of the unique characteristics that I keep mentioning is it's almost 70% of lab space. So of the square footage, it's almost 70% pure lab. They've really reduced the amount of um, non-usable or non-lab space in that building. That's a tremendous accomplishment. Uh, the delivery method of the actual facility was a third-party CM. Uh, they built it using a design-build process, which is not what we normally do from an internal standpoint with our master list GCs and architects. It's Traditionally, uh, the method we have been using, a GMP and then a fixed fee with our architects. So the design build was a different approach. And then the other facility where we have a very similar relationship is the Center for Health and Healing, the CHH building. That is located here in Portland. But now this goes into one of the other characteristics. It's a third party owner. It was not constructed by OHSU. Uh, it's not on our main campus. Um, and then it offers a variety of services. Inside the building, we have some outpatient clinics, very little bit of research, some administration. Mostly it's clinical. Mostly it's a clinical building. So what are the challenges or what are the reasons? What happens and why would we consider a CM? For the majority of our work, we're handling it in-house. When we go outside, 
it's very difficult because a CM firm not only has to deliver on the program, deliver on the services they provide, but they also have to put resources towards marketing and also focus on the budget. We get uh, very good information, but we don't get the detailed information that you saw earlier in that um, very simple pie chart that I showed you, which of course in this day and age of instant gratification and having all the information at in our fingertips through iPhones and other smart devices, people are clamoring for more and more detail more often, almost instantaneously. And sometimes that can be challenging with a third party firm. We get some arbitrary metrics from time to time. We develop metrics, and yes, they can be arbitrary, but we have to defend them. We have to be able to back them up. When we're trying to compare other firms or other organizations, as you can imagine, if we were just to look at cost of construction, if we were to look at, say, square foot costs of a new lab space here at OHSU versus other academic medical centers, it would be somewhat arbitrary if we didn't have a variety of um, assumptions listed out, examples listed out, details and constraints listed out as to how we came up with these numbers. It would be very difficult. And often we don't get that. So sometimes the metrics are uh, somewhat ignored. Uh, and then again, the competitive pressures, right? We're competing against them. They're competing against us. It becomes a challenge for both sides. But there are, change, there are situations like we have these two where it makes a lot of sense. Let me touch on those. It makes sense when there's a finite capital program. So for example, in both of those facilities, there isn't a tremendous amount of refurbishment or remodeling that's going on compared to, say, our main hospital or our research facilities where we have new PIs, we have new technology, we have new programs that are constantly coming and, and supplementing and moving the mission of OHSU forward. It gives us the ability on these two facilities to have a pure service model. It's very low overhead. As you can imagine, the requirements, the space, the physical location to house 35, 40 people within our department, and then, of course, the overhead that comes with that and just the day-to-day -day living that comes with that, that doesn't exist for us when we have these two facilities and go purely CM for the construction, but then also for outsourcing all of the building management. And then, of course, the flexible staffing model. Because the projects have been flow within those facilities, very, very uh, often, sometimes there's a lot, sometimes there's none. Uh, it gives them the flexibility, gives us the flexibility to simply be, again, that pure service model. The one consideration, the one thing I would say that we have learned, which most people would probably say is common sense, would be that no matter how it's approached, you have to have some level of owner oversight. It's not just a pride of ownership. It is truly looking out for yourself. It is the owner's oversight. It has to be there. So just to recap, the three areas that we talked about in the presentation, we do have a variety of projects that we manage wholly in-house. We do have a situation with the CLSB Securities Tower where we're managing in a combination or a hybrid where we have an owner's rep internal team, and then we also have hired a program manager, um, construction manager. And then finally, we have two facilities where it's purely outsourced both to construction and the operations. So where is it all going? Where do we see it going? I think it's safe to say we're seeing not only at OHSU, but at the macroeconomic level, more small projects. We're seeing fewer and fewer of the middle-sized projects. We're seeing a lot, a higher quantity of smaller volume projects. We're seeing this from the healthcare side. We're seeing this from NIH. We're seeing this from the grant world. We're seeing just a higher volume and smaller project in the dollars. More CMs in a crowded market. As that trend continues, we're seeing more CM firms either getting larger through consolidation and having that presence, or we're seeing smaller ones creeping up. And so we're having more people, quite honestly, knocking at the door, more people competing. How do we all compete? That's the question. And where should we compete? What's the best value? It's the constant reanalysis, constant analysis and reanalysis of what's the value proposition not only of the department, but of the CM firm and the building operation firm, that, and how they bring that to the owner. So with that, any closing thoughts, comments? No. What questions are out there, Sergio? Uh, definitely, guys. We got plenty of questions. So again, thank you very much for sharing this information so far. So let's see uh, how many of these we can get through in the time allotted. We have a large uh, program management firm asking, by mainly operating with an in-house PM staff, how do you ensure that your staff benefits from best practices used by other organizations? Um, and they comment, an outsourced PMO provides you with the benefit of infusing your organization with best practices developed from working with many different client organizations similar to yours. 
That's an excellent question, and it's something that we constantly struggle with. So what we've done is we've recognized that that is a question that is asked by almost every owner organization out there. How do you tap into, how do you get a hold of best practices? So what we've actually done with our friends over at Kiri is next Thursday, OHSU is hosting the first annual Capital Construction Project Management Best Practices Symposium. And as of Monday this week, we have actually sold out. We are at capacity for the symposium. This is our first ever. What we're doing is we're bringing that project management staff from over 35 other owner organizations and CM firms together into one room for an entire day to discuss exactly that. Best practices around what it is that our staff, our project managers face on a daily basis as project managers, as owners, and as owners reps, both internal and external. So this is our first forum to see if we can try to get that best practices, define those best practices, and share them among all of the owners and institutions. And you bring up a, a great point, and I know uh, that you guys are also active with other organizations, as you mentioned, Construction Owners Association of America is one, Construction Management Association, where, where you do have that opportunity to do exactly what you guys will be doing in your symposium next week, I guess, on a larger scale. So um, let's see, another, uh, have you found that your team will be more aware of having the best building possible, knowing they will be around for the first year to follow up on any warranty issues? And actually, before you answer that, let me ask another question that preceded that, which was, does your department take ownership of the building for the first year uh, in terms of handling all warranty issues? Uh, so in terms of warranty issues, uh, it's a, I would say it's a collaborative approach. Uh, our department is certainly the point person with the general contractor, and it does help that we have long-term relationships with these general contractors in terms of warranty. So we, you know, we have staff from those GCs on campus every day. Uh, they, they're, going, they're going to be working on a number of projects at any given time, so they have people here on site that can address warranty issues very quickly. Uh, the reason I say it's collaborative is that we do commissioning and handover to our operations and maintenance department at the end of every project. They, of course, are going to be the first point of concern whenever anything occurs, good or bad, within a building. Uh, so they end up involved, but the first person they tend to call is the project manager who completed their last remodel or construction of the building. <clears throat> so we have a follow-up question and says, um, besides project management teams, do you have a designated organization for the program and or entire portfolio of projects is the first part of the question. The second part is, is your reporting organized to generate consistent reports across all projects with program portfolio level reporting being produced as a direct roll-up of the detail project level information? So the answer to both questions is simply is yes. We break up our programs into three, actually three programs. We have our academic and research program, we have our healthcare program, and then we have our special projects program. So the CSB Securities Tower Project is reported on independently, and the academic and research program, which is what I'm responsible for, and then our healthcare program, which is what our, my counterpart on the healthcare side, Bradley Taylor, is responsible for. And so we do report on these in a variety of manners. We report to about 200 people across the organization on a monthly basis, a variety of times, a variety of information. But that is at the program level. Uh, there are some micro programs within those overall programs that we report on. on. So for example, the research component or a funding source may allow us to report to certain folks depending on their level of interest. But a variety of program levels, that's the ultimate roll-ups is there are three of them and there are three of us that manage those programs. Now, in terms of the systems that you're using to generate those reports, is this one system or is it across multiple systems that you're tracking this information? It's all one system. We're generating all these reports out of eBuilder. Okay. Uh, somebody wanted to know, with negotiated GC contracts, what is the project delivery method? Is it design, bid, build, CMGC, multiple prime, design, build, et cetera? Yeah, we're, we're doing uh, primarily, and I, I say primarily because the small projects will do a little bit of design build or design bid build, uh, but primarily it's all CMGC with the GMP. Have you guys done any work with uh, IPD type uh, contracts? <laughs> That's a great question. So 
the more that we've dug into the IPD model, whether it's been through how one of the regions in GSA has delivered it, how Sutter has delivered it, how a variety of institutions across the country, how Erie delivered it in England, we found that there's a lot of characteristics of IPD that we inherently do. That's how we deliver projects. That's how we approach them, which is one of the reasons why our project delivery time is so short. What we haven't done is we haven't formalized a contract or a contractual form that allows us to institute an IPD contract. What we've seen, we've seen great success with folks who apply the IDP, ID, uh, IPD methodology and philosophy, but they still hold the traditional GMP and fixed fee pro, um, contracts. So it really comes down to the person and the owner and the leadership and the management capability of the individual driving the project as opposed to the contract language. That is one consistent trait that we've seen across IPD. So the answer would be yes, we, we try it, we apply it, we seem to see we have a lot of consistencies in the methodology. What we haven't done is formalize the contract or a contract language around right. IPD. We view IPD, uh, and again, we know there's the, the contractual side to this, which can be very difficult, but it's more about the relationship. And to, to that end, what we've done with our four GCs, and this helps having a defined set of GCs and, and architects uh, in our master list, we've provided space on campus for our four general contractors, their primary, their PMs, their PE, uh, that's just a few steps away from our own offices. So we see them every day all the time. And on the Collaborative Life Science Building in Skirties Tower, the new building that I just talked about, we're actually all cohabitating on the job site. So the architect, the owner, the, the consulting owner's reps, and of course the GC are all housed within the same trailers. And we have found that to be an extraordinary benefit, um, not just in the, you know, the speed, obviously, with which communication happens, but the relationships that that builds. It ends up having, you have a different level of communication. Uh, you're not just talking business. It's, um, there's an inherent benefit to living with these people throughout the duration of a project. Okay. Um, have you ever compared costs of a CM firm for a particular project against the cost of in-house? Every day, <laughs> <Quite honestly, laughs> every day. It would go back to the uh, the government and private sector organizational structures of our hospital and our academic and research missions. As you can imagine there's a number of people in a variety of leadership positions here at OHSU, and every one of those has their contacts and network, and every one of those has a contact and network. So. Not a day goes by that somebody is knocking on the door asking questions or questioning of the way OHSU does one thing versus another. So we're constantly prepared and being very proactive and have been very proactive about that question exactly. And so that's how we've come to the conclusion on a couple of facilities that we have where getting a CM involved or supplementing like we have on the CLSB Skirties Tower, our own in-house with a CM actually provides a tremendous amount of value. So we do constantly compare our cost, and we constantly watch our cost. It goes back to the metrics, and one of the requirements of being in-house is constantly watching those metrics to make sure that we are comparing. And when it makes sense to bring someone on and supplement or completely own the project, then we do that. So yes, we do compare on a regular basis. Well, we've only got time for a couple of more questions, so I'll see. Uh, somebody wants to know, do you have any, this is an interesting question, by the way, because. Do you have any function within program management to improve learning from projects? And I think this is something that we've heard from other clients. And, and I, if I'm reading this question correctly, relates to the actual documenting of lessons learned through yeah. you know projects to continually improve. That's a great question. So lessons learned is one of those things that everyone can collect in some way, shape, or form. Right? You can come up with a form, come up with a format, come up with a way to get it. But then what do you do with that information? So we've combined a formal process of lessons learned with an organic one. And I say organic because one of our project managers just happened to do it about a year ago. He felt very strongly that he had some very challenging clients, had some very challenging end users that weren't happy when the job was all said and done. So informally, he put together a project closeout meeting, went there and said, I really want to know what you guys think. And he came up with a handful of questions to get the conversation going. And before you know it, it was an hour and a half conversation where people were almost in tears, they were hugging, they were happy, they were angry, <laughs> the range of emotions came out. And it was a fantastic event. It was celebrated. We, we took it all the way up the chain to show, look, this is actually very, very valuable. We share it with our department. 
And now let's become a staple of our projects. We actively decide how do we gather that information, when should we hold that meeting, and how should we disseminate the information across our entire department. It's still a work in progress. I don't think there's a single project management office out there in the world who truly understands how to regularly gather and then spread and impact and actually execute best practices. And so someone, if someone can figure that out, we would be happy to hear that. I would love to hear what other people are doing about how to do that part. But gathering information, we're getting pretty good at gathering the information. Well, guys, you have been more than kind with your time today, so I'd like to, to end it off with that question. We've got at least another 12 uh, questions that, that we, we'd want to answer, but I think what we'll do is I'll forward them to you, and what we can do is maybe you know, send the group, everybody that registered a, a list with all the questions and your answers, because you know, we'll, we'll just, I'll just document those as we go through, because again, it was, they were very good questions from what you guys could, could gather as I was going through these. But I don't want to, you know, take up anybody else's more time. We committed an hour, and here we are at the one-hour mark. So again, uh, Glenn, Kyle, thank you very much, guys. And very excited to hear about your symposium next week. I'm, I'm <clears throat> sure it's going to be great and uh, sold out. I mean, that's a good sign, right? That's wonderful. Thank you, Sergio. Thank you for everyone. Uh, hopefully, we didn't draw it on too long. So you guys have a wonderful weekend. I'm sure you guys will be enjoying the warmth of Portland. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you for the opportunity, Sergio. Take care. Bye-bye.